from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the second day of this uh, International Summit of the Book. We have a number of new visitors and more will be coming in and going out, but we're very glad that you've come back for a second day. Uh, I'm going to just say, and, and of course this is devoted, as yesterday was devoted primarily to the past, to the history of the book, uh, up right up to the present, and now we're looking at the future. And I thought it might be useful to begin with a few general uh, remarks. Um, first of all, with so many implements and forms of violence still loose in society, it's interesting to sort of begin, I think, with the question of uh, how, in the presence of all this, and in the presence of history, which is not particularly encouraging, um, we can keep humanity from self-destruction, which it has had the power to do for more than a half century. We've been fortunate so far. One of the interesting, one of the few genuine lessons of history, history can be used to prove almost anything, but is that accountable participatory relatively transparent uh, governments uh, do not fight one another. The long history of wars does not have any example of two societies that have those characteristics, whether they call themselves a democracy or not. Even the word democracy has been appropriated to all kinds of people. Um, don't fight each other. So that's an interesting, an interesting lesson of history. Now, the second thing I'd like to point to, just as a historian, is that the United States is a kind of interesting test case. Now, I'm speaking not in terms of, just in terms of power or in terms of uh, national, little nationalistic injection since we're here in the nation's capital, but for very re interesting reasons. It's a continental uh, civilization. It's a multi-ethnic, increasingly multi-ethnic, society, and it's an example, I think, of a country that was put together on the basis of the values of the book culture. It is what I have come to be calling, in the talks that I occasionally give, a dialogic culture, a culture based on dialogue, and it also includes now substantial elements of our citizenry from every part of the world, not just from every continent, but almost from every part of the continent. Small numbers, but still, it has that kind of variety. And the values of the book culture are, of course, dependent on reading. And that's why it was so thrilling to hear David Rubenstein announce yesterday this made these major prizes for literacy, for overcoming illiteracy, and even alliteracy, that is to say, people who can read, probably have read a lot in college and never read another book the rest of their lives. Now, um, dialogue is, of course, one person speaking to another. Um, and um, that begins, in many ways, with reading, because you have a mute dialogic partner in the author of the book. And that author is speaking to you as a reader, and it doesn't happen unless you, you can read what he's actually saying. But anyhow, dialogue with the mute witness from another time and place, which is what an author often and usually is, I think has a lot more to say for it than talking heads in the present. Because as you may know, if you're a follow cable, you, people aren't even allowed to finish a sentence very often. And um, the idea of um, the founding fathers of our country 
was a very interesting one. If you trace how they spent the day, when natural light came up, they began reading in the morning, even before breakfast. It began with reading, then it involved doing something in the real economy for most of the rest of the day. And then at the end of the day, they began talking. They talked in churches, they talked in uh, meeting houses, they talked in general stores like Justin Morrill, the great man who introduced advanced learning for everybody and that ideal into the United States just 150 years ago. And we, together with uh, the eminent Vartan Gregorian, who honors us with his presence today, we, we celebrated this man and began to see that he began in the general store where all aspects of the economy were conducted and where people talked with one another. There was an endless dialogue. It's evident from the archives of this remarkable man, the longest serving congressman, had no leadership position, but introduced this presumption of continuing an advanced education that would lead to practical life in the real world. So, um, the interesting feature, I think, um, is the way in which reading was combined with experience to lead in the late afternoon with rather high consumption, it must be admitted, of alcoholic-based beverages. Uh, but in any event here, these people were talking to one another. One of the most beautiful archives we have here in the library is the Wawan Press, which is the attempt to bring the music of Indian, American Indians, Native Indians, uh, into modern garb, which we are transcribing from the 10,000 wax cylinders, which have the oral history of the American Indian, which we're in the process of transforming so that we'll be able to understand what was at the base of this oral culture and be able to transcribe it and preserve it. But the word wawan means one person sings to another. What a beautiful idea. Because talking, singing, it was all one thing in early culture. And to when you're reading something, when you're alone with a good book on a rainy day, it's a form of music that's going on, silent music that's coming into your own experience. And this ties in, of course, with the last talk yesterday, which dealt with Thomas Jefferson and his library and this, this marvelous idea of organizing it according to memory, reason, and imagination. But for Jefferson, who gave us that wonderful idea of, of uh, the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence, for him, the highest form of the pursuit of happiness was the pursuit of truth. Uh, and it's a pursuit rather than the possession of truth. The great Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig said, truth is a noun only for God. For us imperfect mortals, it's always a verb or an adverb. It's a wonderful thought because this is the pursuit that gives dignity and the hope of progress, the hope of advancement to us all. And um, the interesting thing is it's not competitive. We are a very competitive society that's an engine of progress and invention and so forth. But one person's discovery is another person's opportunity and it's an ongoing process. The endless pursuit of truth as the highest form of the pursuit of happiness and the one form of pursuit that keeps us from the pursuit of each other, which is worth thinking about. Um, the leading philosopher probably in Europe today is almost unknown in this country. A guy named Habermas has the idea of what he, I won't use all the terminology he uses, but basically, the idea that um, conversation, that one person not only talking to somebody else but listening, that this is, the, this is the way you move forward. And you move forward in writing when it's possible to put it more precisely and when you have the sequential thought that the, you have book length exposition. I think whether it's on a Kindle or out of an early codex, it means that there is some cumulative power in the story you tell or in the argument that you're making. So that's, in a sense, what we're 
talking, we're trying to pay honor to the tradition that certainly put our country together in the first place and will hold humanity together with all these accelerated, rapid, hurry up, noisy forms of communication we have, that we get a little bit back into the world of silence and slow time, which is in reading and the beginning of the dialogue that can continue and has no end of the possibilities it can produce. So, and again, the fact that our great ideal in this country, is, uh, is the idea of liberty comes from that Latin word, mean, liber, meaning book. So that's what we're here to talk about. And I just say one final word of conclusion uh, to try and tie up what I said at the beginning. How do we keep humanity from, which is increasingly interrelated by all these new forms of communication, economy, economics, security, and so forth. How do we keep from tearing ourselves apart? One of the great, uh, the other we're lucky to have Sir Harold Evans with us today, among others, but he uh, was another uh, philosopher of history that we studied when I was a student. He's been all but forgotten, but Arnold Toynbee had two marvelous ideas. He said, basically, first of all, that um, civilizations uh, rise because of the work of creative minorities within a culture. And they have this way of perfecting themselves or giving way to a society that, that honors a creative minority within its midst. And that's important in the life of dialogue, of course. But then he had another conception that I think was good, withdrawal and return. And that's what reading is. You withdraw yourself from society, but then you return to it re-fortified, re-energized, uh, re-motivated to talk to somebody about it, with somebody about it, who may have read different books, but like the Founding Fathers, they all read different books, had different economic experiences, but they all came together to engage, engage in dialogue. And so the dialogic culture, which is, I think, in many ways, the key to, key to learning how we can live together in this country, ourselves, in, in all countries and between and among countries, is intimately attached, I think, to the primary act of reading, to the sustaining, for instance, of that basic unit of human thought that permits sequential storytelling, that permits sequential serious argumentation, and that is the sentence. And the sentence is being slowly eliminated from chat rooms, uh, and one of the great linguists of our time contends that we may soon have a universal language of pidgin English already foretold in the language of computer programmers and air traffic controllers who universally, wherever they are, speak a kind of pidgin English of five or six hundred words. And if that is our future, two generations from now, people will not be able to read a good English novel of the 19th or 20th century. It will be as hard for them, maybe harder than it is for us to read Beowulf now. So this, what we're talking about, is a thing of great consequence, I think, for our common future. That's why we're glad to have so many who are here for the Partners Meeting of the World Digital Library here present with us to engage in this dialogue. And to begin it today, we're fortunate to have our, one of our first and certainly one of our most illustrious ambassadors that the library has sent out to young people uh, in America. Walter Dean Myers, and he's going to be interviewed by our own John Cole, founder and continuing leader of the Center for the Book within the Library of Congress, which has centers in all 50 states and in some foreign countries. So we're very glad to have them lead it off. It's my great pleasure to turn things over to John Cole and our Ambassador Walter B. Myers. Well, thank you, Dr. Billington. Earlier this year, Dr. Billington 
named uh, Walter Dean Myers as the third National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. This is a project of the Center for the Book with the Children's Book Council and its uh, nonprofit arm, Every Child a Reader. The notion of a national ambassador would be someone who traveled the country on behalf of young people's literature, promoting it, and also uh, expanding the audience for reading in every way that we can think of. Uh, my prop for today, you already have. There's in your kits this morning, and on the table in the back, there is a bookmark, which has uh, Walter's photo, and also a brief explanation of the National Ambassador Program. It lasts for two years. Walter is midway through his uh, two-year term uh, speaking on behalf of reading. And today we're going to learn a little bit about his experience. But I'd like to start uh, by asking him how he chose his particular theme uh, for his activity, which is reading is not optional. Uh, Walter, do you want to tell us a little bit about how that came to be your theme and a little bit about, I happen to know that it's his own early background that it has helped lead to this theme. As I began speaking to uh, young people and how we approach them with uh, reading and with books, uh, very often I would see uh, teachers and librarians saying to young people, oh, books are wonderful, they will take you to far off places. And um, someone said, a ship is, a ship is like a frigate. Um, and I began to ask the young people, what did, what did this mean? And they began to say things to me like, oh, if you want to, you can uh, have a lot of fun with books. And if you want to, um, uh, you can enjoy yourself and perhaps learn something from books. I, I, I thought this was, was bad uh, because reading is something you have to have uh, to uh, exist in this world. My dad, who was a janitor, uh, could not read or write, always prided himself on the fact that he could support his family. Today, he couldn't, not without reading. And how reading affects all parts of our lives, including national security, uh, is just is not spoken about very often. You know, one of my sons um, is a chaplain and was a chaplain in the Air Force. And he was saying there were weapons that the um, Americans have that they couldn't use because people couldn't read the manuals. Um, it, it's, just, it's just coming uh, more and more, um, the gap is, is, is becoming more and more. The most American thing that we have, the most American thing that we have in this country is the ability for the lowest classes to lift themselves, to make themselves whole and to prosper. But without reading, they can't do this. So this is why, you know, my own, my own background is um, I was raised in a foster family. Um, my mom uh, read, and I guess a third grade level, but she read with me uh, four days a week, a true romance uh, magazines. I, you know, <laughs> and I didn't, um, I didn't understand what the true romance magazines were about. <laughs> I didn't learn about true romance until I was reached my 30s. But, <laughs> but the, uh, and I wasn't attracted to the stories so much, but I was attracted to being with mom, with my foster mom. And I would watch her finger go across the page. And eventually, because the reading level of this true romance was fairly low, I could pick out the words. And by the time I reached the age of uh, five, I could read to her as she ironed and as she worked. And that was, um, 
you know, I, I never knew she was giving me something. I never knew she was transmitting a, a skill, but today I, I know it. And then, Walter, you went on to school for a few years, right? You, right. And you were in school until when? Till what age? Uh, I was in school until I was 15. Um, I, I did fairly well in school until I was 14. Uh, when I was uh, 14, my family began to disintegrate. I uh, had an uncle that was murdered. Um, my father went through a depression. My mom, who was always sort of a borderline drinker, became an alcoholic. Um, and so I was thrown away. Uh, that so completely filled my mind that my grades plummeted. Um, but I had books. I had the New York Public Library. <laughs> Thank God for the New York Public Library. And I had books. So when I had uh, the difficulties with my mom, I found my, my emotional voice in Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Stephen Daedalus, whose mother asked him to pray with her, and he refused, and that tension. And when I had the idea of sometimes being fearful, I had the red badge of courage, Stephen Crane. Books gave me the voice that expressed my individual humanity. And, and was, those books then helped turn you into a writer. Do you want to talk for a moment about how you got into writing? I began writing. Um, I had speech difficulties as well, but uh, my, my siblings and all had speech difficulties. We came up from uh, West Virginia. Um, and I couldn't speak very well or read very well aloud. But uh, so eventually a teacher said, OK, you can write something. You can copy down. A, well, if you laughed at me, John, I would throw my books at you um, or hit you, you know, <laughs> depending how far away you were. Um, but she said I could write something. I began writing little poems. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, that was the only thing I was praised for at, at that age. You know? And um, I, I enjoyed writing. I dropped out of school at 15, was caught, put back into school, uh, dropped out at 16, and joined the Army on my 17th birthday. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And you have before you one of the most prolific writers of literature for young people. Walter's written over 100 books. Uh, he's known throughout the country and the world for his concern about, in fact, youth, and which is reflected in most of what we would call his young adult uh, fiction, which has a focus based on his experience being born in Harlem and being a New Jersey boy, basically. Uh, and this is a career that is remarkable and is one that is now he's now sharing uh, through his travels around the country. And I'd like to ask you uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening, what has happened during your first year of touring. Uh, the only conditions really for a national ambassador would be the selection by the jury, which uh, are, consists of experts in children's and young people's literature which uh, we host at the Children's Book Council with myself and a number of experts, uh, including Robin Adelson, who is the chair. Uh, and that we ask that the person that we choose is known not only for his or her books, but their real ability to relate to kids. Basically, it's turned out to be a key thing. And the little obligation reminds me a little bit for the minor obligations for the poet consultant, poetry and uh, poet laureate for the Library of Congress. They need to appear at the Library of Congress. They have a, a couple of other minimum obligations, and then it's up to them. For Walter and our two previous uh, ambassadors, uh, John Cheska and Catherine Patterson, uh, they have not only helped open Children's Book Week in New York, but of course come to our National Book Festival. So we are getting a guarantee of a top-notch writer uh, through this obligation. But Walter, in particular, chose a theme. Uh, reading is not optional. 
and we were able to send him during his first year uh, through around the country and I think you visited some new places. I do think you went to the Louisiana Book Festival. Yes. Which was sponsored by the Louisiana Center for the Book. And I'd like you to perhaps point to a couple of the wonderful experiences that I know you've had, not only at places like festivals, but your concern about visiting detention centers and talking to young people in detention centers. Well, that one of the uh, other qualifications you didn't mention was that you have to be very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> it's distinguished with a small goatee and at least six feet four. Right. So uh, I, I'm particularly interested in uh, prisoners because I wanted to know their, their reading uh, levels. What did they read? Um, what was going on? with their adventures with, with books. Uh, and for me, since I've been in this game a long time, I've been, writing, I've been writing years and years and years, I've seen prisoners that I first saw in grade school, in, in, in second grade and third grade, then you'll, you'll see them 15 years later in uh, 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 maximum security prisons. And to me, that's absolutely shocking, uh, but it's, it's, it's the, the truth. And I find some young people who come to reading for the first time in prisons because they, they don't have the, the uh, uh, community um, putting them down. They uh, somebody calm down from their family uh, anxieties. Uh, and they discover books, and we can send them books. And we have, you know, through many of the organizations that I, that I work with, um, very often you have to, they, they can't uh, accept hardcover books, only soft covers. So you're ripping off the hardcover on, on the books. Um, it, it's very difficult. But many of the prisoners tell me, especially the male prisoners, and the females are growing at a, a tremendous rate, that if they had read, they felt that if they had read early on, they could have changed their lives. They could have known, number one, that their anxieties were not unique, that their problems were not unique, and that they could have found ways of handling their, their problems. And I was in the prison yesterday with um, kids, I, I, to me they're kids, between uh, 16 and 18. Some of them were uh, in that jail for murder, you know? And to see a young man, 16 years old, who, who is now facing 39 years of his life in jail, and then understanding also that there were, um, there's another family that suffered a loss, is, is shocking. Now here, here is a young man I wish that I could have grabbed when he was seven and grabbed when he was eight and maybe taught his parents or his caretakers or his grandparents of the dialogic reading uh, skills. If I could have done that, I, I think I, I could make a difference. And that obviously is your continuing motivation in visiting detention centers and prisons in hopes that they, you can make a difference and, and, and I try to uh, correspond with them. Uh, you know, they, the system does not make it easy to correspond with these people um, because they're not allowed typewriters. They're only, only allowed uh, a small correspondent list. So right. it's, it's difficult. Well, that will be part of your second year as well, I know, as uh, our traveling ambassador. Uh, we're also making an effort to send Walter to other parts of the country and I heard a rumor you're going to be making your first trip to South Dakota to go to the South Dakota, I've never the, been to South Dakota. Uh, South Dakota Book Festival, where he will be featured. Uh, and that will be a, a Center for the Book event. And we also uh, have you going to Florida, just to keep you on the East Coast for part of this. But in between, each, at each stop, he is 
uh, asked to try to see uh, young people in uh, some of the retention centers. Walter, I have another question for you. I see you are wearing a rather handsome medal. Would you, <laughs> this is the... <laughs> you, can, you can touch the medal, but it means we're dating. <laughs> <laughs> this is the medal that we've had uh, made for our various national ambassadors. And the first one, uh, John Cheska, uh, has continued to wear his. Catherine Patterson isn't quite as uh, frequently caught wearing her medal, but we're very pleased that, that you have it and that... Uh, it's awkward in the, sh in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you felt when you learned you were selected as national ambassador. You know, I've been looking at um, uh, literacy for many, many years, and I've seen the gaps, uh, especially in the English-speaking uh, countries. And I've been uh, very much concerned. So while I am very grateful for the opportunity to, to spread the word and to uh, read so much ab about uh, literacy and all the research that's been done, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility that I take very seriously. I know I hope I don't finish this. I want to, to finish, uh, actually, my, this term, this year, my life, <laughs> uh, as being useful. Being, I, want, I want to be useful. You know, on, my, on my tombstone, uh, you, it, I went, he was useful. I lived a long time. <laughs> I lived a long time. <laughs> But I want, I want to be useful. You know, I don't want just to say the words. I, I want to make a difference. Well, you already are, and I thank you on behalf of not only the Library of Congress and the Children's Book Council and every child a reader, but on behalf of the audience and for our country for the wonderful job that you're doing. Let's give Walter Dean Myers a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're coming to the second session of our day, which will be a panel discussion on the role of cultural institutions in fostering the future of the book. I will turn to the panel's moderator, Sir Harold Evans, to introduce the panelists once we are all on the stage. Sir Harold is a distinguished figure in publishing and journalism. I'm sure you have heard of him. He was president and publisher of Random House Trade Group, the founding editor of Conad Matt Nast, Conad Matt Nast Traveler Magazine, editorial director of and vice president of US News and World Report and the Daily News, Atlantic Monthly, and Fast Company. Currently, he is editor at large for Reuters, you may know him, as I do, as the author of the book, The American Century. Sir Harold is one of the world's most distinguished journalists and has received the highest awards for his lifetime of achievement. Please welcome Sir Harold Evans. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you very much. Wow. I've got to say that when this is Dean, my contribution is that my grandfather was illiterate. And I'll never forget the time my father was reading the Daily Times, which I was then editing. And my father was a steam train driver who left school at 11, but loved reading. And he flung the paper on one side. He said, isn't it amazing that you're editing this paper and your grandfather could not have read a word of it? And so that was the influence, really, of reading. First on my father, and then my mother, who left school at 11 and went to work in a cotton mill. So where's the rest of this panel? I don't want to hold this stage by myself. Uh, we're going to have a discussion. Uh, we already had a wonderful start with Walter Dean, uh, how we can actually get people to read. Uh, there was no question of it. it this is Carla Hayden. You can find all, all about her in the program you've got. Distinguished librarian. And I was greatly taken when she 
referred to the book to me. We have never heard it referred to before. She said, it's a container. I've been fretting for the last 30 years about the disappearance of the book, as I know it. And I'm married to a digital wife who works in digits, and I'm used to hard copy on books. Anyway, Carl has redeemed my faith, and here's somebody else who's Sorry, also, Ira. he's a refugee from publishing. He's now doing good work. Uh, <laughs> And, and we've got, where's Jim Leach? Is he hiding? Oh, he's here. Hello. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right, Jim, sit down. Well, we know what you do, but where do I, oh, you sit there, will you? Uh, this is a very important panel, really, because when you think about it, I mean, I just came, apart from telling you about my grandfather, I just came from Durham, which is my university, and I had to go up there not make a speech in the cathedral, but I'm always reminded whenever I go back to Durham, which is such an important institution in the rise of Christianity and also of the book. And I just want to read you one little thing here. We're going back to the 8th century. It's about 7, 790. And in the Codex Aureus, which many of you will know, the Golden Gospels, an alderman of Surrey uh, testifies as follows. Um, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, alderman Alfred and Weyburn, my wife, obtained these books from the heathen army, those are the Vikings, now known as Danes, perhaps the most civilized nation in the world, they are. I mean, incredible. They come top of the legatum index of the most prosperous and civilized nation, but then they were barbarians, so there's hope for everybody. <laughs> so, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, Alderman Alfred and Weyburn, my wife, obtained these books from the heathen army with pure money that was with pure gold, and we did for the love of God and for the benefit of our souls, and because we did not wish these holy books to remain longer in heathen possession, and now they wish to give them to Christ's church to the praise and glory and honor of God. So in the whole rise, of course, of Christianity and, of course, of other religions, the book is absolutely crucial. So I want to start, really, by saying everybody's terrified at the moment, especially in the publishing world, which I, too, escaped from, uh, actually, in, in books. Um, how can we encourage people to read the book? And does it matter whether they read the book digitally or online or not? What, what does it matter? Does it matter? You mentioned the container. You mentioned the container. I stole it. <laughs> and thank you. Um, we're finding, and this is I'm speaking from the public library perspective in libraries, that we are actually attracting more people with the pull of the digital container. In fact, we just received a grant to expand while the publishing industry is going through all of its um, uh, challenges. A, a grant to provide more ebook titles and also to actually loan e-readers, generic e-readers, to the public so that they can download and then walk out of a library with this reader and sit and... You, you, you print it there and then? They can download the e-readers and do that, and they can also have the other books. So we're finding that um, actually it's encouraging uh, the act of reading. Right. So I'm going to come back to you, Jim, at the end. Uh, I just want to stop another ex-publisher here, agent and so on. So you don't care whether it's in the book or in digits? I think as long as people are reading, it doesn't matter what the work is contained in. So, I so think the generational you, shift points well, to... What about the beauty of the book? I mean, the, the typography the, and all the... Books. I love books. Yeah. I don't know that the next generation will have the same experience that I grew up with in terms of the tactile experience, the, the physical experience. And as a professional who's concerned with getting work out, I don't care as long as they're having that solitary experience with the work of a writer. Um, it breaks my heart. 
I, I mean, I think the container is beautiful. I really, I love to look at a Nantalee's book, I'm not sure if she's here yet, who does a note about the type at the back of everything she publishes. I love to look at the decisions a publisher has made with a writer about whether a book is going to have embossing, whether it's going to have ragged edges. I love to watch people in bookstores touch books and have that tactile experience. But I think ultimately what we get is something so deep and personal and about this kind of one-on-one -on -one experience between the reader and the writer that however that happens, we need to encourage it. Um, technology is bringing us someplace else. And as long as we keep the artists right. in our fold and keep readers and writers connected, we'll be OK. OK, Mr. Leach, you're such an influential figure uh, now. And you have been previously, I'm telling you, OK? So what I want to, want to know from you, in directing your energies uh, in, in continuing literacy and the preservation of all that means, you don't care either whether it's a physical book or a digit. Well, in one sense, I, I, the agency that I had, and, and because I hate to speak exclusively as an individual, uh, has a love affair with the printed word. But uh, while we're not ag agnostic exactly on how something is presented, uh, we are very public oriented, and so you uh, do everything you possibly can to move thought into the public domain. And that implies that you use every conceivable instrument. And uh, we're in the knowledge development and the knowledge dissemination business, and so uh, we do film, uh, we preserve old books, we uh, help finance the writing of new books, and then we try to uh, uh, bring the public into access to knowledge that exists. Uh, and therefore, uh, we are very big into digitization. Uh, and uh, in fact, there, one of my favorite quotes is our uh, archivist, the United States, who likes to say, particularly in the area of research, for many young people, young scholars, if it isn't on the internet, it doesn't exist. And that's, that's a fairly awesome thought. Uh, and so that means that, that uh, uh, Ira speaks to nostalgia to some degree, as well as to tactility. And I think we all identify with that, but we also identify with uh, what I hope is a dual circumstance, that you can have a book with paper, and you can also have a book that is access, accessed through the internet. And mm -hmm. that is almost the ideal world when you're speaking of the book. Now, it may be that the use of paper will recede, but that's beyond our power. Uh, that's going to be a public choice. Well, I have to Donald, jump in, in a little in, bit in, um, right. in terms of where You're the text You're going to or praise or... Oh, no, it. just continue uh, because okay. um, as a former children's librarian, I have to say, and brain research has shown that the tactile and the book as an object or that container is where you are getting the earliest and most important experiences with text and illustration. That's where you find the wonderful um, embossing. And, and if you've ever seen children's uh, picture books, and you know that that's where that type of creativity and engaging the mind, that actually the digital is not as useful and helpful uh, from zero to six. And so learning and having that appreciation of the object Right. Uh, can happen well, in I, earlier yeah, states. I, was seeing, I have at home the Lindisfarne Chronicles. I don't have the original, they're in the British Museum. But somebody gave me a replica of the Lindisfarne Chronicles, beautifully embossed. And if you've never seen them, they're just incredible. But I want, you touched a point of real importance when you mentioned children's books. And I'd like to ask uh, everybody here. Uh, I have five children, okay? And when I was a young man uh, bringing my kids up, I was really... Uh, depressed by the low level of b books that were available to children. In the end, the best books we had, I didn't give them Mark Twain immediately or, or Charles Dickens, they were five and six. I gave them abridgments of Treasure Island, the classics, and th which were no longer available. I, I, mean, I wasn't, uh, uh, I'd like to have done that when I was a publisher. So what can you do 
uh, in the humanities, in Stark and Mr. Leach, to actually make the reading experience an excitement for children. They, there's all the arguments about whether you should look and say phonetics and all this. So, but how can you actually get that excitement stirring early on if you've got, you know, you've got cats sat on the mat, obviously you've got to go through all the phonetic stuff, but the, when you get to children's books, when I was a father, I still am a father, but when I was first, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to disown all my when kids at once, to you. <laughs> but I found that very frustrating. What can you do about that? Well, the challenge of young people is very uh, terrific, and I, I think we ought to bring back our former speaker, uh, our ambassador. Uh, my wife is a children's book writer, uh, and she writes in art history, and she finds that it's uh, enormously helpful to involve the visual. Uh, in fact, uh, at the youngest ages, the great books are pictures with a few words, and then they get more and more sophisticated in the sense of, fewer pictures and more words, and that might be a step backwards, but it's, it's a, 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 a fact of how we, we deal with things. But uh, I, I, it's, I think the greatest challenge in America when you look at the statistics on crime, I mean, the kids that do not learn to read have not a slight factor, but an overwhelming factor that they're gonna spend a lot of time in jail. And so this is a national challenge for all of us, but. Uh, the other aspect is what is relevant to kids today. And you can hardly dictate relevance, but uh, there are aspects of the imagination that people seek out. And uh, uh, sometimes in the worst kinds of circumstances, the greatest kind of joy is sought. Uh, I, I saw a demonstration of this uh, that seems really odd, but it applies to the book from another visual medium uh, a nonprofit organization gave a colony of people living in the, the, the country of Lebanon, but they were refugees and therefore in a camp. Uh, all the kids, a small brownie kind of automatic camera, uh, and uh, they took pictures. And they were astonished that every single picture, almost without exception, the kids by instinct chose someone smiling, something funny. Um, and there is a, a great, uh, uh, as Sesame Street has found, great uh, kind of a appeal of, 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 of a new world that people want to visit. And books are the way we travel. They're the, they're the adventures of life. And so uh, there seems to be something very young uh, in the human spirit that seeks something not just exactly the same, but something... Mm -hmm. Somewhat different. And Neil? I sat at a dinner table about three weeks ago with a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. And the parents <clears throat> are a novelist and a poet. And I was shocked to see the four-year-old spending quite a lot of time on the family iPad. Actually, there's more than one iPad in that house. And reading on the iPad. And I, you know, the old publishing salt just was offended. How can you let this child play with this device at the table. Meanwhile, the eight-year-old is actually in, in her books. She's kind of, you know, the, the, the bookworm at school. She's very high up on the bookworm. And um, she kind of looks down on her brother because she thinks, you know, she's more adult by reading real books at eight. And the parents said, you know, it doesn't matter. This is what turns him on. If, if it's the screen that he's playing with, if he's getting through a book from beginning to end, we don't care. When he goes to bed, it's bedtime with a book. That's the rule. But if at the table it keeps him happy and occupied to read Dr. Seuss electronically, we're OK with that. And um, I realize there's, there's a shift going on. How do you feel in the competition are between that kind of the book with a smile on the face and so on and the video games? I mean, most young people I see today are doing video games, and which are Fairly violent, I would say. That's an so, issue for the parents. Huh? I don't think that's an issue for uh, those of us working in the arts and humanities and libraries and publishing. I think that, that's, that's about parenting. Um, but the smaller and, and more efficient devices become, 
as we grow technologically as a culture, certainly the more distractions every device will have on it. Uh, but I think, you know, I mean, you and I can, can look back to the publishing industry crying about the, the VCR. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, my God, the VCR is going to ruin the industry because people are now going to have these big, fat things that they threw in a big, fat machine, and they're not going to read anymore. I mean, every generation has some bugaboo, but every generation has maintained a commitment to reading because it's primary, it's intimate, it, it defines us culturally. Um, so I think we should keep video games off the table. Yeah, the, when I was president of Random House, the first thing I did was restart the modern library of classics. And you know, the best single success we had was uh, to tie in with uh, the BBC who were doing Jane Austen. So it was suggested, why don't we publish Pride and Prejudice again? And, and one of the staff said, why don't we publish all Jane Austen again, tied to the television series with the image of the TVs, we had a, we had almost, we sold out. We sold out the first edition. Second, there's almost a Jane Austen had been completely rediscovered thanks to the time with TV, uh, which raised another point, which was in uh, discussing uh, the relationship between Hollywood movies and literature recently oh uh, with uh, the man who heads uh, Showtime and Michael Linton, who's president of Sony. And Michael Sheen was arguing that it's okay uh, to depart from the literal truth of the book to create an, a dramatic emotional moment, which intrigued me. I think all librarians can attest to the power of having popular media uh, take a book. Yes. Uh, the, right after a book is on television or in the movies, we have a rush of people. And then we use that kind of sneakily to say, if you like this, try That's that. That's good, I love it. And we do that. The other thing that Ambassador Myers mentioned. By the way, just to drop you one thing, I want you to say, <laughs> in my lifetime, the librarian has been the biggest single asset, and I don't mean elevated people like Dr. Billington, I mean humble village librarians who say, right. this is a book for you, and so it proved to be. And that's the key in terms of having someone there. Um, I was so pleased to hear the ambassador say that librarians, and I took and wrote it down, librarians should not be defensive about reading uh, is not optional. Uh, we have used that. Uh, it's going to take you away. It's so joyous. It's not optional. And we <laughs> need to just say that as librarians because when you have in many uh, Households, you don't have that reading culture or, or people who are reading, and to provide that uh, opportunity for young people, uh, the grabbing them when they're seven or eight or even beyond, and providing an opportunity for the family to read together. We have a program called Family Reading Circles, right. and we use high quality picture books, and the parents or caregivers share those with the uh, young people. We feed the the family, and uh, these are in transitional homes, um, all the housing projects and things like that. Most of the time, the adults have very low literacy levels, but these picture books give them an opportunity to share, not be ashamed that they can't uh, read well. How many, how many, and it turns into a discussion about the issues. How many issues. people come to the library? Oh my goodness. Well, in Baltimore City, for instance, we have um, a 38% adult illiteracy rate. What? 38%? And that's Ooh. totally illiterate. And then you think about 10 to 5 and more percent uh, that are barely literate. And people are flocking. And that's why when we looked at technology as a, as a way, um, it's non-threatening in a sense, but they're reading with these tools. So we're trying to grab them however we can. How many, how many do you know, how many libraries, I mean, this is a ridiculously broad question in a way. But uh, since literacy is obviously the start of it, and I support uh, Liz Smith in New York with literacy programs, she raises money, and also a lot of other things, but how many libraries or how many public institutions, apart from schools, I'm talking about libraries, actually have literacy programs for people who can't read a word and are totally ashamed to even to admit it? Oh, many. Quite a few. Uh, the American Library Association is really strong on this issue, and we have adult illiteracy of uh, very large dimensions in the country, some of it related to uh, immigration, some of it related to uh, 
uh, a greater uh, amount of dyslexia than we, we ever imagined. Uh, and so uh, I, any substantial library does have a literacy program. We, we run the nation's largest literacy That's program. The National Endowment for the Arts, right. Called the What's Big your Read. To Jim, by the way? We are two floors apart. I'm very fond of his wife, <laughs> um, my colleague, Ira. Deba. Uh, the the endowments are so different in terms of their mission, really, but, but utterly complementary, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, just to be very precise, the, the National Endowment for the Arts is into creativity. Uh, and so that means uh, poetry, music, et cetera. The National Endowment for the Humanities is into perspective. That is history, literature, philosophy, all the related disciplines. And so we complement each other. Right. And we have overlaps. I mean, for instance, if you put the word history of before any subject, it falls into the endowment for the humanities. So history of art is a NEH function. It goes to him. Uh, no, it goes to me. Oh, it goes to you. Okay. But the, yeah. there are, are but, programs we've both funded. And, there, but, and, so, who, and so, we, so we mutually fund them. Who's the bigger of you two? We are precisely the same in size. No, the are. intellectual heft is I mean, clearly on the humanities <laughs> side. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, but, but, but They both, survived the culture but, wars much but what, better. What than happens than when you get a funding fight? Excuse me? What happens when you get a funding fight? You have to appeal for uh, Well, we, we, first of all, we work together. We, we complement each other, and we complement each other in a, in, a, uh, in a facing off with the, uh, the Capitol Hill, of which we're on today. Uh, that is, uh, we advocate each other, and we have precisely the same uh, funding level. And so there, there is no competition between us. Uh, there is a competition for federal resources. There's also a competition for proving your worth to survive to the public. Uh, and both are uh, uh, absolutely fair circumstances. Now, the country as a whole, uh, the endowments are, are frankly less well-funded than they were 30 years ago. Uh, we peaked out in 1979 on inflation in dollars. Bases were about a third of where we were in 1979. Uh, in terms of impact, uh, we would both argue that, that uh, we're quite vibrant. Uh, in fact, my institution, I call it a, a billion word agency of the United States government. We have precipitated uh, for publishing over a billion words. And that's, that's a rather impressive circumstance. All right. Uh, what can I say? We, I, for those who don't know, the endowment in terms of literature. In terms of what we're about here, the book. The, the book, we support nonprofit publishing throughout America. We are the primary source of funding for nonprofit literary publishing. Give me an publishing. example of a, a nonprofit publishing. Gray Wolf Press in Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the strongest mid-sized independent publishers is designated as nonprofit. And I know we have an international audience. This, this must be explained. I, I went through this at the Frankfurt Book Fair a couple of months ago. In the States, there is a tax designation which allows a publisher to be essentially charitable. Thus, it, it moves itself out of the commercial realm and is designated as nonprofit. It's doing work for the public good. It is in essence allowed to take charitable contributions to do this essential work. So that community who have chosen to be nonprofit and they tend to be publishers of um, high literary fiction, translation, You don't help publishers poetry. who are accidental and nonprofitable. We will, we have a, f <laughs> no, but we do actually. <laughs> we have a commitment to, we fund fellowships to individual writers and a writer who gets a fellowship we, we spend about a million dollars a year, or I should say invest a million dollars a year every other year in either poetry or prose, allows a writer more comfort to go into the commercial market knowing perhaps they could take a lower advance. And we fund translators. And that too is a wonderful thing because when someone comes out of our process of funding translation, it is more likely that Grey Wolf or Farrar Strauss and Giroux or Knopf will say, oh, they've won a National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowship I should really have a look at that. 
So we are fueling the commercial economy as well, and by supporting literary centers where writers read from their work, by supporting workshops by writers, it's, I, I like to refer to it as the literary ecosystem, and we're all in it at some level or other. Uh, writers will move from Grey Wolf to Farrar back to Grey Wolf. We will fund a small house in Michigan called Zank to do the digital backlist of a lot of writers who've fallen out of print at Simon and & Schuster and Random House because there's no value in, in that copyright at Simon & Schuster or Random House. So we're in there fighting and we're in there playing and our relationship to the commercial field is arm's length at best, but we, we do peer review to, to give our grants. So we actually look to the commercial world for their advice on where we're going in this new digital realm so we can use that advice to help our nonprofit publishers. Be very important. When I was uh, at Random House and uh, Jason Epstein, who's one of the most distinguished editors, uh, invented the trade paperback, when he was trying to tell me I ought to spend more than I thought was reasonable, like a couple of hundred thousand, well, a lot of money, let's say on this particular occasion it was about $300,000. He said it was the history of the Spanish Inquisition. He said, this book will belong after we're all dead. So he said, don't worry about the dead. <laughs> um, well, that was really, actually in the end, all the books that he recommended actually worked in the end. But it's very, it's very tricky publishing. Just to mention one instance, I had uh, one year 12 books in the Library Association. Of, no, there were 12 books and I had seven of them. Uh, Martyr's Day by Kelly Gore, Vidal, United States, David Remnick, Lenin's Tomb. I had five, I was very proud of them. And I said, uh, since I was having an argument with my chairman about whether every book should be profitable, I said, it can't be done. So I said to my finance director, these first class books, Library Association, they must be good. Uh, tell me what profit they make. So he came back in, he said, are you ready? I said, yeah. He said, you lost $363,000 on those books. The best book. I said, go away. Go to the New York Times list and go through the editor's choices. He came back and said, you've got 27 books in the New York Times best. He said, that's the good news. I don't tell him it was bad news. He said, yes, you lost, uh, what was it now, $367,000 on these, even more. But the point is, he said, but you published two that made a profit of two million. So that was the world of publishing. So in terms of the book, publishers, I must say this in their defense, are often publishing books they think I know are going to lose. We can't make it work. And then surprise, surprise, it occasionally does work. So that's why I was asking you that question. Right. Well, I mean, I think this gets back to the title of this talk, um, which is about how cultural institutions right. can, can help. And I think as publishing goes through a very radical transition Terrible. right now, there needs to be a call for more cultural institutions to come to the aid of literature, to come to the aid of publishing, to come to the aid of libraries, to come to the aid of scholars, right. because that investment that commercial publishers make will likely be smaller as the profits are smaller as they are on digital books, as we see merger between places like Random, Random House and, and Penguin. Penguin, as we see layoffs across the industry, as we see a lack of independent bookstores on Main Close. Streets in America, as we see libraries fighting with their communities about space and how to find money to go digital to help people, as we find that the arts are the first thing to be cut and scholarship is the first thing to be cut in this culture, I think we need to address what cultural institutions can do and how many of us need to actually carry that torch and get out there and find more support for the field of literature and libraries and scholarship to, to keep right. books it's, alive and well. Indeed. And just to, in, in journalism, where I come from, uh, there's now a tremendous similar crisis. Investigative reporting is very expensive, it's often, so they can't do it. Print is anyway in decline generally. Uh, so magazines and newspapers are, are uh, and the one answer is a thing like ProPublica or British Investigative Journalism in, in London, which are philanthropic ventures. But I, I sort of felt uneasy about that. 
the federal agency that uh, helps libraries is the Institute of Music, your partner, IMLS, and they provide grants for programs like the Family Circles, as well as giving libraries the opportunity to have what we're calling now creation spaces, where we actually let people create their own books uh, for young people as well as adults to have turn our libraries into not just the place for consumption, but also creation. And that has been really helping in terms of being able to match public dollars and that grant that I mentioned that we're so proud of, the largest grant um, so far to a single library for e-books and e-readers, was actually um, a call to publishers and everyone that's upset that libraries will invest and libraries will be supportive just like we have been with the other container. And so just coming together, the Digital Public Library of America is another example of everyone participating and saying, we will survive in the digital age. Just, just out of curiosity, <coughs> there have been price issues between yes. the publishers and the libraries. Yes. Uh, the, the digital books have been priced very high. Can you tell me how that's going? I know there's been well. It's Some. bringing librarians back to being what we were called during a certain time, a couple of, several years ago, feisty fighters for freedom. Oh, you were um, during the Patriot Act. Oh, you said it, I didn't. <laughs> uh, um, so librarians are basically saying, we will, we are your partners. We've always been your partners. And for people who can't purchase or bookstores are having difficulty, this wonderful book that's out now in my bookstore, it's a, 86 authors are talking about their favorite independent bookstores. Um, we are the, the public's university, the, the place that, that everyone can get these um, materials, and so we should be partners. So it's important for librarians to, to actually make some changes in the way we purchase. Uh, we have electronic resources librarians that are just selecting materials. Um, and our structures need to change to reflect that as well. Any ideas from overseas to help us in this? Uh, any ideas from other countries how we can use other cultural institutions? I have one example of myself, and you've probably got more. I had a dinner recently with Pa Monk, the Nobel Prize winner from Istanbul. He wrote the book called Museum of Innocence. And I've not been there, but my wife went into the Museum of Innocence, which is a building in Tehran, in uh, Istanbul, which is full of all the things from mentioned in the novel. Lipstick, a handbag, a certain time, type of handbag. And people have been going into shops asking to buy the particular handbag, which was mentioned in the book, which <coughs> they saw in the museum but the museum is entirely made up of things from his imagination. These people and these objects never existed. So you go in the museum, you look at the lipstick from the heroine or the handbag she bought or, or the bed she slept in or whatever, it's all in the museum, and it's, it's a complete fake. There's no, such, there's no such thing. It's all out of Parmonk's head. So in other words, they go in there, and then they're turned on to reading his novel. You get the idea? The museum, the museum is an artifact of a fictional book. The fictional book assumes a real physical life in the museum. And that's the creativity that... That's the creativity. That's what with I mean. with this, librarians, we are definitely, uh, we have spent many... You can't build up a whole museum of an artifact from one of my books. But wouldn't, like, wouldn't it be really wonderful in one of those creation stations in a library that people could create what they saw or in their minds in a book. The, the greatest criticism when you see a movie that was made from a book is that, oh, that's not what I thought it was like. You know, everybody says that, or that's it right. should have been like that. So those creation stations could actually be that. So librarians have to loosen up a little. Uh, right. We're pretty, there, there, we've spent a lot of there time. There are analogies to movies huh? for sure. In fact, uh, right. I don't think any book has been published with uh, a, uh, someone in the private sector saying, you put my candy bar in this, in this book and we will pay you, the publisher. They do that for movies. They sure do. Uh, and that's product a, a different field. But there are lots of... Uh, Faye Weldon did a product placement novel, didn't she? Years ago. Yeah. 
and it was quite controversial. It was, and it was really kind of a postmodern prank for her that wound up blowing back in her face. But maybe we'll get there. Maybe. But there are lots of, uh, I mean, Iris talked about the nonprofit world. There are lots of cooperations that go on. I mean, in this room, uh, uh, Bartron is here with the Carnegie Foundation, NEH and Carnegie and the American Library Association, uh, helping publishers have are putting out a, a Muslim world bookshelf uh, in which there'll be 30 books on Muslim cultural issues sent to over 800 libraries in the country uh, as a nonprofit uh, kind of cooperative effort uh, with the government and with uh, institutions of governance, which libraries are throughout the country. Uh, and so there is a lot of cooperative effort that does, that does take place. And there are a lot of visuals that, that, that come to mind. Uh, uh, my favorite uh, uh, e example is, is, uh, comes from uh, Azar Nafisi, who wrote uh, uh, Reading Lolita, was it in Tehran? In Tehran, yeah. And she s says that when she speaks to her students, she would say in, in Tehran, can you name an American president of the 19th century? And very few could, but one or two might say, wasn't Lincoln in the 19th century? And then she says, can you name an American literary figure? All hands raise, and they say, Mark Twain. Uh, and so who is the bigger impact in the world? Is it a literary figure or is it a political figure? Very interesting. We think politics as a society often when really literature is the powerful driving circumstance. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you, Another cultural institution we've not mentioned is advertising. Yeah. I had always resisted at putting ad advertising in the random house books. We got offers occasionally, whether it be for you know, pharmaceuticals. And yet, when you take, take something like Ian Fleming's novel, James Bond, Tattinger, you all know Tattinger's the champagne he drinks, what's the car he drives? Everybody, what's the car does James Bond drive? The Aston Martin, of course you know. The, the Aston Martin, now... Known as last that's, movie, that's blew an up, so I don't know if <laughs> That's well. a British, a famous British racing car. But that's in, it, that's in the book. But if I was offered Aston Martin advertisement when I published James, Ian Bond, James, Ian Fleming used to work on my newspaper, so that's why I get confused. Um, it, 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 what, what's wrong with it? Is it aesthetic? Well, I don't, I don't think you were yet in the States when the agents actually banned advertising from, it, it was mass market paperbacks, and you can find them in used bookstores that still have Merit cigarette ads in the back, and there was, in fact, advertising, which offended many writers, and, and the agent, I mean, there is a no ad clause, you may recall, from the Random House boilerplate, and that, that exists throughout, what, what that has turned into is, there is corporate sponsor, sponsorship of book launches. You will find corporate partners. I mean, when I was an agent, I worked with Cole Haan to launch one book through an ad trade that they had done with The New Yorker. Because, you know, you take any opportunity, you can. I mean, the media really works with partners in fashion, particularly and in, in liquor because they're always looking for an upmarket right. audience, and yep. the reader of books is that allegedly upmarket audience. So you'll find that, that type of support there, but I think, um, I don't think the numbers are really satisfying to advertising companies, unless it's a Grisham. I don't but, think very But Sir Harold is not pure, and the reason I say this is that Random House will advertise in your books. And what you advertise are other books, are other books uh, often by the same author, but sometimes beyond. Yeah. And so you do advertising. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, 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 book festivals help, don't they? In oh. Texas and other places and so on. Um, have you got any other, any other ideas to enhance any other cultural institution we can recruit? Advertising, museums, libraries, uh, what the else? Small Business Administration oh. would be a delightful federal partner for independent booksellers who are struggling 
to stay alive. Um, I'm on the other side of where our administration went with the Department of Justice case. I feel like oh, tell us thing, that. things Just went awry that. there. The Department of Justice case on price fixing against six publishers fixing their ebook prices, which essentially, from where I sit, pitted intellectual property against technology. And, and given that we're on the precipice of you know, that, that funny divide where um, the tech sector is, is using intellectual property in a way that doesn't compensate the people who make it, th there are many other conversations to have about this at a later date. We're watching a lot of transition here. Um, there are opportunities for all kinds of governmental and non-governmental partnerships to come in. You, you had asked about other countries. France and most of the European Union support net book agreements. Britain let it go a long time ago and it hurt the publishing industry. A net book agreement keeps prices set and firm. Every bookstore maintains the same price. It allows the now, bookseller... Are you, are you hostile to that? Not at all. No, good, nor me. Not at all. I, no. I actually think it's kept independent booksellers yes. in business throughout Europe. I think it's kept publishers right. in business throughout Europe, and it's provided writers with their royalties. Exactly. Uh, it's a, one of the things which is really maddening at the moment, and it partly springs out of the web culture, is to say, there shouldn't be such a thing as copyright, everything should be free. But I hate th it. This is the divide we're looking at well, right now. Well, this is very important. You know, had Google and Microsoft and people wanted to get rid of copyright. But how can you sustain writers and then books without... They can't live on cheese. Well, some of them can, but most <laughs> of them can't. Cheese and wine. What? Cheese and biscuits. You know, well, no, this is too. partially why we're here. <laughs> Um, no, to support are you, those are you, are you two scholars. united on that? Does, does the National Endowment and, and the Humanities, are you united on this attitude to providing finance for publishing and books via copyright, et cetera, or, or for having it well, all free digitally? Well, we, we, we certainly have an instinct for uh, uh, the people that produce literature, people that produce history, uh, perspectives, uh, but we're uh, not in the in the business of making law, Sir Harold, and uh, we also have an instinct for uh, uh, wanting to have access. And so, there's a distinction between, uh, for example, supporting the concept of copyrights and whether they should last 85 years or longer, uh, and what kind of of uh, uh, access to uh, uh, digital capacities exist for books that aren't being sold. Uh, and these, these, these are really serious questions. Yes. Uh, because suddenly we have locked up in every library in America uh, books that are not being sold uh, that uh, a lot of people would like to have access to uh, if, if uh, uh, it was free. And that's what digitization basically provides. And so to some degree, people are going to have to come to grips with this. There's a secondary issue, by the way, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the visual arts, where uh, artist uh, uh, families for extended periods of times have copyright, uh, in effect, p powers over uh, great works of art. And how long that should last is, a, is a, a really powerful question. I will tell you, as someone who came from a legislative background, uh, that uh, fairly narrow commercial interest really dictated a process at a particular period of time. I doubt if exactly the same decisions on extending copyrights through the ages would pass in today's environment. Now, whether it will be pared back, that's a matter for uh, legislators and, and uh, the lawmaking process to look at. But clearly, you, copyright itself uh, should be maintained, whether it should be maintained exactly in this framework is an open question. Carla? Uh, access, I think. Huh? When you said Where do access, you stand on this? Well, I mean, you like everything part. to be free so that I'm going to spend any money on the books, oh, right? Oh, we'll spend money. <laughs> but I it mean, was then, the no, access. Seriously, you have a budget. You know, we it have would a help budget. you a lot of books with sort of It would help, but five there are uh, materials that are, as uh, you mentioned, locked up or the orphan works or, or things that libraries all over the world own and the fair use and free use and that's why we're very hopeful that the Digital Public Library of America will help with the digitization of materials and also the 
projects that are going on so you can unleash these things. Yes, we'd love to see, uh, think about it, uh, millions and millions and millions of work. Also think about all the digitization that's going to take right now. Uh, that's, but it, that's Google. You can't, oh. right. You can't. So. I just thought that, that Google did a lousy deal on that publishing side of it. It's still in process now. It's still in process. I, I mean, the, the Authors Guild who will be here on Tuesday, probably discussing these things, um, I think is still in, is still fighting Google. There is an appeal. Is that an appeal? Yeah. Well, Our next no. panel is on copyright, isn't it? The next panel, I think, is oh, talking oh, but, about but, copyright but, and that, so I, I they'll mean, get into it. Charlie but I guess I'd yeah. say from the library side, um, back to access, um, as these things are being uh, challenged and fought, you still think about that person, uh, that seven-year-old that wants the window to the world. Right. And, and, the, and the illiterate old man who can't read and is ashamed of it. Well, I want to thank this very distinguished panel for their vivid contributions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Palante, and I am the United States Register of Copyrights and the Director of the U.S. Copyright Office. And uh, I'd like to say uh, at, at the outstart that uh, for me this is a very uh, wonderful privilege because, as you may or may not know, because of the long history of copyright law in the Library of Congress, this Jefferson Building is quite literally the house that copyright built. And with that, let me start by just introducing briefly the distinguished panel that we have. Uh, their bios uh, in depth are, of course, in the program and online. But to my immediate left is Tom Allen, who is a former congressman from Maine and is presently the president and the chief executive officer of the Association of American Publishers. To his left is James Shapiro, who is a professor of English and a Shakespearean scholar and an author and Vice President of the Authors Guild. He's a professor at Columbia University. Thank you for coming down from New York, Jim. And did you also come down from New York? This week I was have, here. This week right you were here. in Washington. You're everywhere. And to James's left, we have Peter Yazzie, who's a professor of copyright law at the Washington College of Law, American University, is also an author. And uh, I will say, although Peter would not want me to, was recently given the great honor by his colleagues at the Washington College of Law to have a lecture named after him. So congratulations, Peter, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> so our topic is copyright and the book, very small topic. <laughs> copyright and the book, authors, publishers, and the public interest. And I wanted to reflect on the title for just a moment because Copyright in the book is, at its core, a discussion about the public interest, with authors and publishers as part of the public interest. And I would underscore that because I think sometimes in some of the more recent conversations in political circles, it's sometimes teed up as a conversation where authors and publishers are somehow antithetical to, or at least in competition with, the goals of the, pub of the public. And that is not the foundational history of copyright law in the United States. So today, we're going to have a discussion about how the book brings together or brings into focus all of the important societal goals with respect to copyright law, incentivizing authors, valuing publishers, serving readers, and protecting freedom of expression. But we're also going to talk about how changes in the book industry, including new formats, new methods of dissemination, and consumer expectations are revealing the need for legal change. Now, many people talk about the need for copyright reform, and people mean different things when they talk about it. But I will say, from my perspective, uh, on behalf of the US Copyright Office, it is clear to us that many provisions in the Copyright Act require review and updating. And the great challenge is how we reflect the digital age in which we live with the foundational principles of a copyright system as laid out in the Constitution. And so with that, I'd like to start with the very thoughtful professor on the end and, and say, Peter, could you say a few words about how evolution of the book may be a cause for both progress and tension 
in the copyright law, including for such long-cherished tenants as, say, the first sale doctrine. I, I will do mm -hmm. my best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for the, the very generous introduction and, and for the, the invitation itself. It's a tremendous and really a very special pleasure to be here today talking to this audience in this space about this subject. The other thing I like about the framing of this panel is that it, it relieves me of a problem that I often have when I talk about this topic of copyright in the public interest. That is, what to call the mass of individuals whose individual and collective well-being is implicated in the constitutional language that, that frames our copyright system and in everything that courts have said over the years about copyright policy and its ultimate public objectives, as, as Maria has described them. It, it's, it's a problem to call them users because it suggests uh, to a, sort of a role that I think is too passive. The same is true, perhaps even more true, of consumers. Citizens is a little, is a little vague and, and perhaps uh, sort of over-inclusive. Over but today I don't have to worry about that. I can just say that we're talking about a public of readers. And those are old readers and young readers. They are sophisticated readers and casual readers. They are sighted readers and blind readers. All readers together. So to begin, what do all these readers like about printed books? As I was trying to think of themes here, I went to the wonderful Elizabeth Eisenstein's new book, Divine Art, Internal, Infernal Machine, The Response to Print in the West from First Impressions to a Sense of an Ending, now out in paperback, I'm happy to say. And uh, Professor Eisenstein suggests two answers to the question, what do readers like about the book, drawn, of course, from, from hi the history of the early reception of print. And one answer, I think, is that readers from the very beginning, from the 15th century forward, have responded very positively to the fixity of the book, the apparent stability that printed pages bound between stiff material gives to texts and to their meanings. She writes, printing came to be known as the divine art partly because it was regarded as the art which preserved all other arts. But somewhat paradoxically, as Eisenstein points out, early readers, like readers today, also valued something different about the book, what might be referred to as the velocity of print, the ability to multiply copies meant the texts and their meanings could and did move with new speed from hand to hand and mind to mind. That the book was both literally and figuratively unchained by this innovation in the mode of production. And here if I, if I had slides, which I don't, I would show the slide of the, the old hand copied volume chained to the desk of the monastery in order to emphasize my point. Um, Eisenstein cites the, the early cleric and editor, Giandrea de Bussy, writing in 1468 for his association of print with the, the generous act of sharing what was hoarded. So we've got the fixity of print on the one hand, which is very appealing to readers, and we've got the, the velocity of print on the other hand, which has an associated equal and sometimes uh, contradictory appeal. So it is fair to ask, what does copyright have to do with all this? And I, I think later we'll have a chance, I hope we'll have a chance to talk about the ways in which many decisions that have been taken over time and will be taken in the future about copyright policy either enable or potentially disable the, the survival and the, the flowering of the book. But I want to talk about just one of the default settings of Anglo-American copyright law, 
one that dates from a, a time long before we had a name for it. That is the rule that after an authorized first sale, as we would say today, of a particular copy of a book, the copyright owner generally has no residual authority to restrain its subsequent alienation, whether by further sale or by gift or by lending or in any other way we can imagine. This venerable, even ancient rule was affirmed by the United States Supreme Court in 1908 and reaffirmed by Congress in, 2000, in, in 1909 and again in 1976. But however old, first sale is no mere accident of history. The doctrine is consistent with broadly shared social values of freedom and autonomy and with the as Maria mentioned, the instrumental goals of copyright to encourage the creation and the broad dissemination, primary dissemination and secondary dissemination of knowledge. Over time, by, by keeping copyright within bounds, including the bounds imposed by the first sale doctrine, we've been successful in sustaining and even perhaps accelerating the velocity of print. And there have been all sorts of important effects from fomenting political change to reinforcing literacy to fostering a truly popular culture. For sale has also given us great collections of books and manuscripts like the one we are present in today. And it's given rise to essential public cultural institutions that serve the reading public directly. First, private circulating libraries, and then over time, academic and public lending libraries. And I want to argue, perhaps more controversially, by helping to make the reputation of writers whose popularity grew as their books passed from reader to reader for sale enabled the emergence of the professional author as we know that institution today. So now for sale is under siege. We hear more and more complaints about used book sales online, and we wait to hear what the Supreme Court is going to say about the application of first sale to foreign-made books when it decides McGraw-Hill against Kurtzang. If the plaintiffs in that case prevail, the doctrine will be significantly restricted. But Whatever the result, I think we can expect a new round of legislative activity on the issue. There will be a winner, there will be a loser, and somebody is going to move for a congressional adjustment. And I suspect that proffered amendments to the Copyright Act will propose, for example, that the United States follow the example of, of European copyright laws, copyright laws in countries that, that do not share our overarching commitment to promoting the circulation of useful knowledge by further restricting or further conditioning the doctrine. So I hope that many, if not all, of the participants in the system by which books are produced and consumed in the United States will be able to join together to resist such erosion to a doctrine that has generated so many benefits and has so many more to offer. And lest we forget, Stephen Colbert is watching. <laughs> In seriousness, I'd like to conclude by suggesting that in coming months, readers and those who care about their interests need to do more than simply defend the first sale status quo, as it were. We also need to urge, again, the responsible expansion of the doctrine to books in digital form, which embody the, the same virtues of fixity and velocity that we associate with printed books while also enjoying a special comparative advantage, their durability and persistence. After more than a decade's experience, it may be time to revisit the conclusion of the Copyright Office and the NTIA and their so-called DMCA Section 104 study that a case had not been made for a digital first sale doctrine, giving the buyer of a book in digital form the right to pass it along to another individual while simultaneously deleting it from the memory of the device in conjunction with it was originally purchased. Business models built on a vision of tethered ebooks, effectively disposable objects that are chained 
not to a monastery desk, but to a particular transaction, may make short-term sense, but they ultimately fail to promote the interests of readers in access to information, which enjoy constitutional primacy in the United States copyright system. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. <laughs> So let's broaden the discussion a bit, and Tom, uh, I'd like to turn to you, and let me say that, of course, the first U.S. Copyright Act protected books. Books were the primary point in some ways, drawing on the protection that the states had already put in place. And you may know that the first federal registration was also for a book, a spelling book, in 1790. Uh, registration is near and dear to my heart, of course. <laughs> And uh, I would just say that today, your members, publishing houses, both large and small, operate businesses that sometimes look like gambling financially. And could you talk a little bit about what is it like to be a publisher these days? And how do publishers approach copyright? Is it, is it more than making money? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Um, I, I, I want to say at the beginning, I have I've given a lot of speeches and I've listened to a lot of speeches of varying quality uh, for, for a very long period of time. Rarely have I listened to a speech and, and thought immediately, I wish I had written that. <laughs> but there's one I want to quote to you. Since the very beginning of our nation, publishers have been catalysts for democracy, guardians of free speech, stewards of scholarship and education, disseminators of scientific discovery, and champions of literature. However one defines a knowledge economy today, it could not have emerged and is not worth sustaining without the production and distribution of books, journals, and other professional content. It goes without saying that wherever there is publishing, there is copyright. Senator Kenneth Keating once called copyright the jugular of the book publishing industry. Now, when Maria said that earlier this year, uh, I thought, I've got to use that. I have to attribute it, of course, uh, to her. Uh, and I certainly would not uh, do otherwise. But uh, it seemed to me to sum up very much what I have heard since I sort of walked into this position at the AAP three years ago. There are a lot of publishers who, frankly, care a lot more about making books than they do about making money. But in this climate, and given the structure of the industry, there has to be a return. And um, one, of the, one of the big six, one of the CEOs of the big six did say to me, I gamble with other people's money. Uh, that's particularly true of the trade sector, the consumer sector, where, where every book is different and you don't know what's really going to work and what is not, but it also applies to some extent to the educational sector as well. The publishing industry is not one industry, really. I mean, it cares. There's, everybody in the industry cares about copyright because it is the jugular. But there are enormous differences between, between the trade sector, the fiction and nonfiction we buy in, in bookstores, and between what goes on in the K-12 market, where sales are made to 14,000 school districts. And that's very different from the higher ed market, where sales are made to individual students, primarily on the recommendations of, of faculty. And that's different from the scientific and technical and uh, medical fields, where, uh, where it's more the, the, the sales of, well, frankly, are mostly digital, mostly, uh, mostly to people who are already in those, uh, working in those areas. So we have a whole range of, of different uh, issues. And I want to uh, say something about a few of them. Oh, I, I do want to say, since I have my own book coming out shortly, I have learned something very important. Publishers really matter. They do two <laughs> things. One, they did have done it with my book. They have lifted the quality of the final product, and two, dramatically extended its potential reach so that more people, I have no idea how many, but at least a few more, will be able to uh, read what any author uh, publishes. I think that the copyright issues today come up between enduring tensions, on the one hand, between the creators and disseminators of content and the users of content. I believe there is now more material for a lower price, more widely available than ever before. And that is the great benefit of the digital uh, revolution, the digital transformation. 
On the other hand, the, that transformation has allowed other industries to rise up, and they have different interests. Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google are important companies. They're big companies. They are frenemies to publishers because we have business relationships with all of them. But on the other hand, they extract a toll for getting our content material to, uh, to the reading public. And therefore, I think uh, there are, well, differences of opinion that occasionally arise, as you might have heard. Um, one of them, I'm going to talk about two areas where, where we, have, uh, we have current issues that are of great significance. One is fair use in the academic environment. As some of you know, uh, three of our member publishers sued Georgia State University because when Georgia State moved its from printed course packs as materials for, for higher education courses to e-reserves, they made another change. They stopped paying a penny for anything put up on e-reserves, no matter how, uh, how long it was. They've, and, and since 2006, not a penny has been paid. And because Georgia State was, in the view of publishers, an outlier in that respect, because we have understood, and we think many people have understood, that, that the copyright is agnostic, or the same rules would apply whether we're talking print or digital, uh, that's what led to, to this particular uh, litigation. And I would say that, that there, this, we know there are, there's all this vagueness and difficulty in deciding what is fair use. And you can run through four factors, but the bottom line, this is hard to figure out in many cases. But some cases are clearer than others. And the cases where large amounts of material are being used semester after semester after semester, not paid for in any amount, no matter how long the length, that becomes an issue for copyright, for copyright owners and for both, the, both for the publishers and, and for the authors. And that is the, the, the gist of, uh, of why that case is, uh, was brought and why it is uh, still continuing. Our view there was that whatever fair use means, it doesn't mean that everything is free. It doesn't mean that there is a, a difference, a fundamental difference between printed material and digital material. And it doesn't mean there's a fundamental difference between a private, a private college and a state-run university. The latter, we actually did succeed on at the lower level. The second area I'll talk about is uh, Kurtzang, uh, this uh, first sale doctrine. And I've seen some critics uh, say that, you know, this is an area where, in fact, uh, Justice Breyer, I think, in the argument in the Supreme Court, said, well, what if a husband buy, brings back a book that he has bought overseas and gives it to his wife? Is that a violation? The answer is, that's not the case. Don't worry about that. There's a reason why there haven't been first sale doctrines uh, brought on a regular basis or brought uh, into, uh, certainly risen to the Supreme Court level. And that's because in most respects, it doesn't matter. Libraries can sell their books. This is not an issue. The difference with Kurtzang is it was an outlier because this was someone who over a period of years bought, uh, bought up uh, the, the copies, the international the copies of, of some of uh, John Wiley and Sons products designed for international sales, imported them here and made profits pushing close to a million dollars. Now, why are there different prices? And I'll end with this. Why, why are there different prices overseas and here? The basic reason is the materials that are produced here that are largely where the cost is largely recovered here, cannot be sold overseas, in overseas market, and particularly in the developing world, uh, for the same price they're sold here. And therefore, just as in the pharmaceutical case, there are reduced prices precisely to expand the market, and in, in, uh, we believe to extend uh, American educational products, American higher educational projects, the best in the world, to places where they would not otherwise exist. That's where I think the first sale doctrine, the Kurtzang case,
touches the public interest. Because I don't believe Americans really want to create disincentives to educate the rest of the world. And I don't think uh, that makes good policy for the developing world, and I certainly don't think it makes good policy for an industry that is a very important export industry. I mean, that's what book publishing is. We are an export industry. American products are among the best in the world. There's a market overseas for these products, and we have to find to, uh, some accommodation. So what I would say in conclusion is, these issues, there's anxiety, always, as you make this kind of transition from relying entirely on print into a world where we have to produce both print and digital products. There's anxiety about business models. There's anxiety about copyright. <coughs> there's worry that there is a culture in which so much that we get online is expected to be for free. Uh, all of those are worries. But we do not have to dot every I and solve every case with a specific rule. We can live together as long as there is respect, both for the needs of the public, the needs of readers, and the needs of the authors and publishers who bring these important uh, products to the, uh, to the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Jim, you're here both as a scholar and a representative of the Authors Guild. And the Authors Guild, of course, is the oldest and uh, primary organization that represents published book authors in the United States, about to celebrate its 100th birthday, uh, a celebration that opened to the public on Tuesday uh, here. And uh, I guess, Jim, what I would say is the author is the center of the copyright system uh, mentioned in the Constitution primary beneficiary of exclusive rights, and yet sometimes really invisible to the public in conversations about copyright. Last year, in an op-ed piece for the New York Times, you wrote the following. A rich culture demands contributions from authors and artists who devote thousands of hours to a work and a lifetime to their craft. So what would you say is at stake with the professional author in copyright? Mm -hmm. I should say at the outset that I'm not speaking for the Authors Guild. I'm a vice president of it, but they'll probably be uh, miffed if I get too excited speaking both on behalf of and as an author today. So these are my remarks. And, and I should say before I turn to what it is to be an author, I should speak about what it means to be somebody who uses libraries uh, as we're here at this great, great national and copyright library. Uh, when I was 14 years old, my dad sat me down, my dad's an educator, and he said, you'll likely spend your life either in a library or a laboratory. Decide. <laughs> and, uh, I was a very confused and poor student at that time. And four years later, uh, as a work-study student in college, I found myself getting up at 8 in the morning and reshelving law school library books at uh, Columbia's Law School with a lot of sleepy-headed and hungover <laughs> reshelvers. And I was thinking, is this what my dad had in mind? <laughs> um, uh, he was savvy about it, and I did choose libraries. And I've spent uh, pretty much my entire adult life in libraries, at the British Library, the Bodleian, the Huntington, and uh, right next door here uh, at the Folger Library, where I'm um, uh, uh, one of the uh, Board of Governors, and uh, I, I love libraries, and uh, it's a real honor to be here at the Library of Congress, uh, where I've done research as, as well. Uh, everybody on this panel is an author, uh, and everybody else on this panel is a lawyer. I am not a lawyer, so <laughs> I'm a little out of my depth speaking about copyright and about the nuts and bolts of, of that. And uh, I should also say that I've been witness to and more recently party to some of the various court cases that have come up uh, about copyright and the protections that our founding fathers, as you noted, tried to secure for authors in their writing. And I'm increasingly feeling that uh, these legal cases and the way they've been covered in the press have obscured uh, uh, some of the fundamental issues facing authors. And uh, I've also felt that some of these concerns are either willfully ignored by librarians and judges and, 
and a culture that uh, is intoxicated by that word we've heard a few times. Uh, it's almost Orwellian to me, uh, the culture of free and what the culture of free means for authors who have to make a living writing books. The situation facing writers, and I'm, I'm not speaking of bestsellers here, is grim and getting grimmer for reasons familiar, I think, to all of you, but worth repeating here today. For most writers I know, the math is pretty simple. Earn enough of an advance from a publisher to cover expenses, and if you're lucky, put a little bit aside before you draft your next book proposal. And for the past century or so, this has worked for most writers because there's been a collaborative uh, process that's involved uh, courts and Congress protecting authors' rights, bookstores, bricks and mortar bookstores selling books, librarians purchasing them, publishers paying for them, and profiting from their investment, all working well or well enough together. <laughs> This system is uh, ensured that there was an incentive for novelists and nonfiction writers to take on ambitious subjects, books that might take years to conceive, research, write, revise, and publish, books that are fundamental to a thriving democratic culture. But in our current age of scarcity and increasingly threatening monopoly, these interdependent relationships are strained, if not already broken. And those who are suffering the most from this, to my mind, are writers. Over the past decade especially, there's been a drip, drip, drip of changes to this long-standing and flexible system that has eroded the security of writers. And I should say that rulings to one part of the system that willfully ignore other connected parts, and I'm thinking in particular here of the recent Department of Justice uh, case that was brought up in the previous panel, eager to pick low-hanging fruit has been, from my perspective, destabilizing and potentially devastating and, without question, wrong-headed. Librarians anxious about tight budgets and storage issues uh, and responding to how users prefer to access material electronically are, as you all know, responding by sharing books between branches and, in the case of university library systems, between campuses. That's all well and good when I wear my professorial hat, but as an author and friends of many authors who a decade ago could count on a thousand sales to libraries and now can count on perhaps 250 of those sales, they are now going into their publishers, university press publishers, and being told we can no longer publish your book even though we're committed to publishing monographs because the numbers are no longer there. University presses themselves are shrinking in number, Commercial presses are now combining, and we may be facing only two or three commercial presses in the next few years. What that means for authors is that the days of auctioning books is over. The day of taking a controversial book that's turned down by those two or three major presses and might not find another press to publish them are increasingly near. My sharpest criticism for me as an academic is closer to home. It's to universities who uh, with their libraries are in bed with Google, who have, without permission, copied, digitized, and stored my books, along with millions of others, which they have no legal right to do under the banner of fair use. And they've even started a program to distribute what they call orphan books until it was pointed out that these books are, of course, not only in copyright, but in some cases their authors are still alive. I'm speaking specifically here about the case that has resulted in the Hathi Trust Court case in which uh, I am a plaintiff and which I very much hope goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's, to my mind, an exemplary case of the erosion of copyright protection on technical grounds that ignores the rights of authors our founding fathers sought to protect. I've served on prize committees for National Book Award. I regularly serve on committees for fellowships for books in progress. And I must tell you that the ambition of books is shrinking. The kind of big books that take years to investigate and write, books that uh, uh, are really at the center of our uh, serious cultural conversations are fast disappearing. And they're disappearing because writers can no longer afford to take them on. I have 
conversations over lunch or coffee with prize-winning novelists who are now turning to write for HBO or TV because their publishers can no longer take them on in their works. And I speak as a dinosaur, one whose books uh, have been incredibly well supported by publishers and whose future books are all sold, so I'm not in the position of facing uh, a situation where I cannot afford to research and write a book, but younger writers do. My major fear regarding the resolution of the Hathi Trust cases is not that the summary judgment will, will not be overturned. I'm confident that it will be. But my real fear is that with the University of Michigan and other libraries storing millions of books, that these books will be hacked. I spend a lot of time with computer savvy 20 year olds as a teacher, and I spend way too much time sitting down with university administrators. When a university administrator tells you these millions of books are secure from hacking, they have not spent enough time with 20 year olds. And I think, and I really do think, and I really do fear that the resolution of that case will be moot because we run the risk of having all those works on the copyright with the royalties that go to publishers and authors from them being circulated uh, through piracy or through a disgruntled employee um, taking advantage of that. Let me, let me conclude by saying, lost in all the, the small bore arguments about fair use and digital copying and the battles between publishers and behemoths like Amazon and Google, is the wisdom and the intention of our founding fathers, many of whom were authors, who understood the importance of authors to a democracy and so enshrined within Article I of the Constitution, language that grants to Congress the power to secure for authors, not Google, not Amazon, not libraries or even publishers, the exclusive right to their respective writing. That's their language, not mine. But their language also suggests that the Founding Fathers recognized the need for authors to be freed from being subsidized financially by states, patrons, universities, corporations, even ads in books that might compromise the independence of their work. And by implication, their language suggests that copyright would thereby ensure a diverse range of independent publishers and booksellers that would further guarantee a full range of perspectives in the marketplace of ideas. These two are under threat. I'll just finish by saying when I was 14, uh, I also read a story uh, that has stuck with me and comes back to me every time I sit down and talk with despairing writers. It's about a farmer and his horse. And that farmer thought he would save some money by cutting that horse's rations. So he cut the rations in half. The horse looked a little thin, moved a little slow, but he still made it to market. The farmer thought, so far so good, I'll keep cutting those rations. And he kept cutting them and cutting them, and the horse dragged the goods to market. And just when the farmer got it to a price point where it was just ideal for him, the horse went and died. And that, I'm afraid, may be the end of the story for writers. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> OK, so we have about 10 minutes. And um, unfortunately, we have nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to have you speak amongst yourselves, but I'd like to tee up just one question because I think it's a theme, uh, it's certainly a theme in the broader copyright community and it's come up here already. Fair use is obviously a, a cherished principle of not just copyright law in the United States, but American democracy. Um, I think we can agree on that. Um, in, in recent times though, is it the case that fair use as a mechanism for access has become preferable to access through, say, licensing. Is it because we're protecting fair use as a doctrine, or is it a budgetary issue for some institutions? Is it a feeling of entitlement? Why are we having such tension uh, between fair use, licensing, and access? If you could speak to that. Well. Uh, I actually am I'm not convinced that the tension you describe is, is 
present. Let's, let's take the, the example of the Hathi Trust case that, that James was talking about, and I have to speak cautiously because I'm a, I'm a lawyer in the case, and so I, I, I need to be guarded in what I say. But I think I can say this, that one of the propositions that, that undergirds the summary judgment decision, which I feel obviously you know, different about the, the likely disposition on appeal from, from James, is that in fact there was no licensing alternative available to create a universal corpus of digitized materials which would then be available for a range of what, at least in the view of Judge Baer, were entirely legitimate and positive purposes, including the one with which my clients were particularly concerned, that is um, a, a, a solution to the really terrible book famine that affects blind scholars, students, and academics. And so I, I think that, that the fair use issues that we, we hear about are not so much rejections of proffered licensing solutions as they are assertions of what has been from really almost the beginning of our copyright system, a strong counter trend to the trends that Tom and James have discussed so eloquently, the protection of publishers, the protection of the community of authors, and that is the, the paramount interests of end users and the institutions that serve them. I don't think that fair use, as it is being articulated in cases like the Georgia State case or the Authors Guild Hathi Trust case, is the equivalent of the culture of free. I think that that is a, both a, it's at least an overstatement, if not simply a misstatement, of the positions that the defenders of fair use in those cases have taken. I don't believe that the position of Georgia State or of any other responsible library institution, and obviously I, I'm not in that case, so I can't, I can't speak directly, is that every online use of content for course support purposes should be free. It's certainly not the position of any responsible academic promoter of fair use, of whom I'm aware of. But yes, the position is that some uses, those uses that qualify as transformative uses, should be available without fee, which is the same proposition that's at operation in the Hathi Trust litigation. So I think we can agree that some uses are fair use. Let me just say a word and then I'll defer to when, the former congressman from sure, uh, Maine. Um, my father also told me never argue points of law with a lawyer, especially one expert <laughs> in copyright who's on the other side of this case. But let me say this in layman's terms and speaking as a layman. Uh, and as a professor who, and as a scholar and a writer who relies on fair use. I, I fundamentally believe in fair use. I could not do what I do without fair use. But within fair use, there is a doctrine called transformative use, which you just mentioned. And that is a camel that opens, that's once into the tent, destroys, to my mind, what fair use is intended to mean. And I think Judge Baer had what I would call, as a layman, a radical notion of transformative use that you could just copy an entire book. You're not talking about a little bits and pieces or what constituted in layman's terms, fair use. You're talking about the whole thing. And I think that higher courts will resolve that the Supreme Court has a much more conservative and fair view of fair use that doesn't allow for the whole gutting of fair use through transformative use. Well, I would, I have a fair bit to say here. <laughs> I, I would say, first of all, uh, you know, when you look at what went on with the, the Google and those university libraries, they simply took it upon themselves. I mean, this wasn't a congressional decision. This wasn't a public decision. They simply took it upon themselves to, 
scan uh, millions of books and then keep the digital copies with the risks that that entailed. But Peter, I thought one of your comments was when you said the paramount interests of end users, I thought that that phrase sort of revealed a, a, a view of this area which in my mind is not right. I think this is a creative ecosystem where the interests of the creators and disseminators of knowledge is in balance with the end users. And I will tell you, in the, in the three and a half years I've been at this job, I've talked to a lot of librarians, and I've talked to a lot of university librarians, and they, they are under enormous pressure because of their budgets, their costs have been going up, and their, their uh, resources have been going down. This, is, this is, has been going on for a couple of decades. It's not probably going to get worse with the decline of state uh, contributions to public universities. It is about the money. A, lot, a part of this is really about the money. They do not feel like can afford to keep up the collections they've had. And so they are looking for ways to get more for less. Now, that's a great American tradition, so you can't say that it's uh, all by itself. And then finally, I would make a comment about the idea of transformative use. There has been an established understanding, more or less established in copyright, as to what transformative use means. It's taking the work and changing it in some way that uh, makes it, uh, transforms it, so it becomes uh, something different from the original, something at least marginally different from the original. But in the ARL Code of Best Practices, they suggest that transformative use applies to anything that they would determine was not intended for academic use, but is in fact used in a, in a college or university course. That, that is a complete transformation of the idea of transformative use. Uh, first of all, because it requires a, an estimate of what the actual intention was, but secondly, and more important, it's just using the same material for the purpose of being absorbed by, by, the, by the readers. It's not, in our view, transformative. So we think that what's going on here, and this, remember, this is, we're all part of the same ecosystem here. Libraries are our, our friend, the friends of publishers and authors. But when these particular copyright doctrines get moved in ways that carry I would say, a significant threat to the productivity of the ecosystem, then the creators have issues. Thank you. Let me just, uh, we're almost out of time, but let me say that um, in our office, uh, we're working on a number of provisions that relate to updating the Copyright Act. So we will work with Congress, for example, to find solutions for orphan works, updating the library exceptions. Uh, we believe the Chafee Amendment uh, which, which is the exception for persons with print disabilities, requires updating. And I guess what I would ask you is, uh, since we have uh, had a conversation largely about professional authorship and copyright, is should we be thinking about the legal treatment of authorship differently than we have for the past 200 years? Should we be thinking about different kinds of authors in culture and possibly different kinds of legal treatment? Is that a conversation worth having? Well, I think it's an essential conversation because although professional authorship it remains tremendously important, and I, I, I sincerely hope that, that the horse survives, uh, uh, there is now also a new phenomenon of what might be termed voluntary authorship that has been enabled by new technology. So we're looking in the professional realm, in the academic realm, where some of us live at the rise of, at the, the rise of open access models, which I think need to be embraced rather than impeded, uh, especially since they offer a, a potential solution to some of the cost problems in the library sector that Tom describes, which would not necessarily hinge on the economic interests of anyone. So I think we need to think very seriously about how we treat non-professional or voluntary authorship. And by the same token, the question remains as to whether or not 
the account of the ecosystem, and I love that terminology that we have heard today, is in fact the historically and constitutionally correct account. I think I must differ slightly from the account that says that the original intent of the framers of our Constitution, who then turned around the year after and enacted our first Copyright Act, was to give something in balance to all of the participants in the system. As far as I can tell, rightly or wrongly, those framers had an instrumental vision of copyright in which, in fact, the end user, the consumer, and I'm happy to say it again today, the reader was the ultimate beneficiary of the system. And we may, we may dislike that original framing. We may prefer European-style visions of copyright law. But in my view, we're stuck with it. And I think that more for, more for good than for ill. I would only add to that or qualify it by saying that the framers of the Constitution didn't speak of consumers. They spoke of authors. And I would beg to disagree about their intent. Intent is always very difficult to fathom. I can only deal with their language. And their language was about the exclusive right of authors to their respective writing. And right now, within this system, because authors, individual authors, are the least powerful members of this ecosystem. They are the most endangered. One final thing I would say is that uh, for book publishers, open educational resources, which is where the movement is going, uh, you know, it's a free country. People want to get together and, and develop a course or write a book and, and give it away for free. That is the right of the author. That's the right of the copyright holder, and, and that, that is fine. Our objection has come only when they, the governments, where here or abroad, decide that they are going to fund those free materials and compete with a robust uh, uh, private sector uh, uh, you know, industry. They, they, then, then we get it back up a little bit. But I think that one of the, one, the final thing I would say is this. If you think about the educational market, either the K through 12 or through higher, or higher ed market, one of the hardest things for anyone to do is to evaluate the quality of the materials. And yet, throughout this country in different ways, sometimes with the Texas State Board of Education, you have people without experience in evalu evaluating quality, the quality of materials trying to do it. And the open movement has a burden to carry, which is, can it establish high quality materials over a long enough period of time to compete with, with the uh, curricula that are more than textbooks, the curricula and the materials that are, that are also available. Because that matters enormously to the education of our children and the health of the democracy. Well, if you have enjoyed this discussion about copyright, allow me to end by uh, mentioning that in the Copyright Office, we have a program entitled Copyright Matters. And we have had uh, many speakers from many segments of the industry come in and speak uh, here in the Coolidge Auditorium. We've had the AAP. On Tuesday, as I mentioned, at 3 o'clock here in the Coolidge, we have uh, members of the Authors Guild, as well as John Cole, our director of the Center for the Book, speaking. Uh, that's at 3 p.m. And on February the 5th at 10.30 in the Coolidge, we have Peter, uh, speaking to us about best practices in fair use. And so with that, I'd like you to join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.